OK, so uh, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Fabian Yamaguchi. And today, today I'm going to be talking about uh, information retrieval and machine learning for interactive bug hunting. Uh, we're going to see what that is about. Lots of words in that title. Uh, but first of all, uh, I'd like to thank the HACPA organizers for inviting me. Um, so coming here uh, to, to Bochum uh, is actually always uh, something special for me. Because if you see that, uh, if you see that uh, yellow building there in the back, uh, that's actually where my parents lived um, when I was born. So this is like uh, coming home for me today. And of course, it's very nice to uh, be able to present some of uh, my research here. Um, and the topic today uh, will be how do we create uh, tools for vulnerability discovery uh, which are more effective in practice. Um, and I'm focusing mostly on static source code analysis currently. And this talk will be entirely about static source code analysis. Um, now, as I already said, machine learning and information retrieval are the key techniques that we're going to be using today. OK, just a few words uh, about what I currently do. So currently, I'm a PhD student at the University of Göttingen. And uh, while well, the university is also pretty big, like War Uni, but uh, the uh, computer science department is actually very, very small. So uh, what you see here is our um, computer security group. And uh, the, the guy on the left, that's the professor. And then there are four PhD students. And that's it. On the right, there's the admin and the secretary on the left. So yeah, quite a small group. Um, we do lots of different topics. Um, but to be honest, I focus on vulnerability discovery. So intrusion detection, malware detection, not so much my field. Um, yeah, so that should not be a problem since we're talking about vulnerabilities today. Great. Um, but that's like uh, half of the truth. So um, I kind of want to give credit for, well, some of the things that I developed in uh, the last couple of years actually work pretty well. And this is uh, maybe because uh, there have been some people uh, who uh, have given me some practical experience in hunting bugs. And some of these guys have actually uh, been here and presented at HACPRA. So maybe, maybe you know uh, one or two of them. So there's Gregor Kopf, he presented last year, I think. And then Felix Lindner, uh, who led uh, a company where I worked for five years during my studies. And then on the right, uh, that's uh, Jörn. He actually studied here in Bochum. I don't know if anybody still knows him. Yes? OK. Yeah, so these, these were the guys that I worked with in Berlin. And, uh, it was a company which focused entirely on finding bugs, uh, you could say. So black box testing, white box testing, source code, binary, you name it. Uh, we try to find bugs. And during this research, uh, during this work, I, I commonly, f uh, commonly felt that you know, there are scenarios where I really want to have a certain kind of tool so that I don't have to do all this stuff manually. And this eventually led me to leave industry and go back to university to see if I could actually develop some of these tools. OK, so let's talk about the research focus. As I said, I want to make vulnerability discovery more effective. Uh, and to do this, I try to not replace the analyst. You see this a lot uh, in academic research. Uh, but instead, I'm trying to build tools to actually assist analysts. Um, and I try to look back at the different scenarios that I encountered when I was auditing code to see if I can build specific tools to address these scenarios. And needless to say, if it's not practical, then I really don't care about it. Um, yeah. Um, also, already said, machine learning information retrieval are the key, uh, key techniques. And uh, the reason I'm doing this in an uh, uh, academic setting is that I want to develop systematic approaches. So in, in the hacking world, you commonly see that nobody cares about how you arrived at a bug. But it's actually, uh, if, if, you, if you find the bug, you win. There's nothing systematic about this. But on the, in the long run, you want, to, you want to devise strategies to actually find these bugs. And uh, yeah, that's what I try to do. OK. Now about this talk uh, specifically, um, you're going to see something which is uh, very new and which I haven't talked about yet. Uh, it's an open source code analysis uh, platform for bug hunting. And uh, you can download this. Um, there will be a link at the end of the presentation. Um, and as I said, I haven't talked about it, so let's see how that goes. Um, 
Then there are two machine learning approaches that I built on top of this open source framework, uh, both of which uh, I've uh, talked about already at some point. Uh, one is about uh, extrapolation of vulnerabilities, which essentially means uh, trying to find vulnerabilities similar to one that you already know. And then the second is about detecting missing checks in code, or as you could say, finding odd code automatically. And my goals in this are to motivate you to consider this field of research, because right now um, it's actually not so big in the academic world. If you look into the hacking world, then you have uh, essentially vulnerability discovery and exploit writing. Those are the two topics. But if you look into academic security, then it's a really, really small subfield. Uh, and it would be, would be nice to see some more work in the area. Um, and also, I want to give you some code to play with. As I said, this is all online now. Okay. So um, I started off by looking at different kind of tools which are actually used in practice by auditors and try to find out, uh, and I try to find out uh, what's similar about, about these tools. Um, so you probably know some of these. Uh, what you see there in the back, that's uh, Verb Suite Professional. Um, since this is a web app course, you might have seen this. Uh, this is a so-called um, interception proxy, and it sits between your browser and the web application that you're trying to audit. And essentially, all it allows you to do is it allows you to see and intercept all of these packets and modify them to see how the application uh, responds to this. Then in the front, you see um, Scapy, a packet crafting tool. Uh, who has used Scapy? Some people. Yes. OK, so Scapy. Um, Scapy is a really good example of a tool showing that the users of these tools can actually write code. Because really, it's more of a library that lets you craft different packets, send somewhere, see what comes back. Same approach as with the uh, with uh, Burp, just much closer to the code. And then, of course, there's IDA Pro for reverse engineering. You know this as well. And what I think, what I think makes all of these tools very similar is that they don't try to replace analysts. Instead, they try to, they try to enhance their abilities. Uh, they try to help them explore the program. And they realize that it's perfectly fine if we don't try to automate bug finding entirely but only partially. Um, so what I think is important, especially when you look at machine learning, is that you don't try to get uh, a program which actually decides whether something is vulnerable or not. This should be something that an auditor decides. But you can provide tools for these people uh, to help make their job a lot easier. And this is the direction I want to take. So uh, in terms of academic work, what you often see is that people try to design tools for candidate B here. Um, it's perfectly fine, in my opinion, if uh, candidate B cannot find bugs using our tool. If candidate A can, then that's perfectly OK. OK. So here's the overview of the system that I'm presenting today. Uh, you can see uh, there's a central component, the, the robust parser, which first gets the code. And we're going to look at why this needs to be robust. And this parser then stores some representation of the code in some sort of database. And we're going to be seeing what kind of database that is as well. And we want the auditor to be able to ask questions about this code and get responses. And in the back, we have some machine learning magic. Things uh, which, uh, like machinery, which does stuff like give me similar code, give me odd code, things like that. So that's the machinery. OK. But before we can do any of this, we need to parse code. And that sounds very trivial, but in fact, uh, it's not so trivial in the end. So when I started doing this, many people said, you know, parsing code is like a, a com it's, it's, it's a, a topic that has been completely covered in compiler design. So why don't you just use a compiler front end to parse the code? And uh, this is actually sufficient in the lab environment, but it turns out it's really problematic in practice. And uh, I'm going to tell you why. So as I said, for compiler people, no problem at all. The problem is that the code we usually have is incomplete. 
And incomplete code, <coughs> well, depends on the language. But for C and C++, if the code is incomplete, you can't parse it because the grammar is ambiguous. So we need to somehow deal with this. So here's an example. You're at a company, and you are asked to audit code in three days. And uh, of course, the customer promised to give you some source code. But um, they only give you those parts which you're supposed to look at. Okay, so it's, there are things missing due to, I don't know, intellectual property is a, is a very common, common reason for not giving you the entire code. All in all, you can't construct a working build environment. Also, there might be libraries, old versions of libraries that you don't really know uh, which version. It, it could take you a while to get this to build. And as I said, you only have three days. And then also the code is visu uh, written for Visual C++, and all your tools are written for LLVM. Okay. These are not theoretical problems, but they're very practical problems. These are the kinds of problems which mean that in the end, you can't use your tools, but you have to review the code manually. Okay. So we need a solution to this. Um, and let's look at the root of the problem here. The root of the problem is that compiler frontends can't parse incomplete code because the job of the compiler front end is to tell you whether some piece of string actually corresponds to a language specification. Now, um, unfortunately, if, for example, a header file is missing, um, then this can't be decided. Um, and here's an example showing why this is the case. So if you look at the thing here, the, the thing on the left, the thing on the right is just a cube, so ignore it. So the thing, the thing on the left, um, it could be two things, depending on what t is. Okay, so if t uh, is a type, then this is the definition of a variable, of a pointer named b of type t. But if t is a function, then this is a call. Okay, see this? So that's problematic. This means that you can't parse c if you don't know of all the identifiers, if you don't know whether it's a type or a function name. And this is the scenario we encounter if the customer only gives us half the code. Right. There's another more drastic problem. It's the preprocessor. So the preprocessor essentially allows you to copy paste arbitrary code some, somewhere into, into your C code. So this is perfectly valid. If you say uh, define plus y means plus y, and then you use it somewhere, uh, like in that sum, in sum is x plus y, then that's perfectly valid C code. But if you don't have the definition of plus, then this doesn't really look, uh, this doesn't really correspond to any rule in your grammar. Yeah. So here's the key idea that you can use to parse this. Uh, you can build so-called robust parsers based on island grammars. And this is a very, this sounds very theoretical, but it's actually not. You, you, can, uh, you can use a parser generator today, Antel R4, for example, really easy to program, and not at all like the parser generators you might have seen, not like uh, Yak and Bison and these things, which are horrible. But this parser generator is actually pretty good. And what you do is you specify uh, productions for those things that, uh, that you uh, want to analyze in detail, so-called islands. And for everything else, you have a catch-all rule. So this is actually some real code for this parser generator. And as you can see, um, in this case, we recognize a function definition. But we are, we are being very loose on what we want to encounter. So what we say is, OK, a function definition needs to have a return type. There needs to be a function name, a parameter list, and then a compound statement. But then in there, we say, OK, a compound statement consists of several statements. But a statement is anything we want to recognize or anything that's not a curly. So all we do here is we make sure that this body is actually correctly nested. That's it. OK? Uh, and this anything but curly brackets, that's the water in the island grammar. Yeah. So in practice, you optimize this slightly. Um, you can look at the code. So I wrote a complete island grammar for C and 
parts of C++. If you've ever tried to parse C++, then you know why I'm saying parts of C++. Uh, especially the whole template stuff is really, really horrible. So it, it parses Firefox. It does not parse like the STL, where they use, where they use uh, uh, templates as if they were a language of their own kind. And what I get from this is what I call fuzzy abstract syntax trees. So normally when you pass the parse, you get an abstract syntax tree, uh, which essentially shows how this, this uh, syntactical elements are nested to gain the complete program. In this case, uh, this happens as well. But for the tokens that it doesn't recognize, it simply says, OK, I don't know what this is. I'm going to call this water. Okay? But everything else is still there, even though you can't completely parse the code. And based on this, you can build all the, uh, all the cool constructs that you have in, in, in compiler uh, theory to reason about codes in different ways. So control flow graphs, for example, you probably know this from, uh, from reverse engineering, where you see uh, which statements are executed in what order. Or uh, the thing you see down there is a program dependence graph, which shows you how uh, data flows in the application. You can build all of these fuzzily. <laughs> Uh, and doing this, we've covered the robust parsing stage. And the question which, which now remains is, how do we store this in a way that we can actually retrieve it? And I tried many things. Um, and it eventually became obvious that since these are all graphs, we should not try to store them in tables. And we should also not try to store them in documents. You know. Uh, that's a relational database, document database. But actually, we should use a database which actually supports graphs, a graph database. Okay? And recently, many, many different graph databases have occurred, um, mostly due to the fact that um, social networks have become so popular. So in social networks, you have um, the different people are linked by different edges to one another. So the natural way of storing this is uh, to use a graph database. And uh, this is nothing too complicated. Essentially, uh, they use so-called property graphs, which just means these are normal graphs. And to each node and edge, we can attach dictionaries, so key value pairs. Now, mathematically, this is called an edge-labeled edge attributed directed multigraph. But really, it's just a graph with dictionaries on the nodes and the edges. Okay, So it's consumable, right? Great. So we can now, all, all these constructs we've created, abstract syntax trees, control flow graphs, and so on, we can now place them in this graph database and link them in there. Because there's a natural con connection point for all these representations, because they all contain a node for each of the statements. So you connect them all. And your entire program becomes one huge graph. Okay? <coughs> and in this graph, we can use, uh, well, you know from databases that uh, in, in the relational database world, there's this one language that everybody uses to retrieve records from the database, and that's SQL. Nothing like this exists for graph databases yet. Instead, there are lots of different approaches. Uh, and one of the approaches is the language Gremlin, which is an imperative language that you can use to traverse the graph, to retrieve things from the graph, to formulate queries to get stuff back. And what you do in Gremlin is you define some starting node. You say things like, OK, consider all function nodes, and now start walking. And you describe how you walk in this graph. And then it returns, returns all nodes where walking from your starting point <coughs> to that end node uh, actually worked. Okay. Uh, and Gremlin has a very nice feature. Um, it's that you can, you can define your own little language elements. Uh, they're called so-called pipes. So what you see up there is a very, very simple pipe, uh, the out pipe. So if you're, if you're at a node, and uh, you simply traverse to all outgoing, uh, outgoing nodes labeled by nodes, so all, uh, all nodes that you know. 
um, then you can imagine uh, you can imagine this as if you were putting uh, the start node into the pipe, and what comes out is your neighbor nodes. Okay, and as you can see, you can chain these nodes. So in the second example, you have out nodes, and then there's a filter. Everybody whose age is smaller than 30, and suddenly you get all the people you know whose age is smaller than 30. Okay. So this allowed me to build a query language to express vulnerabilities, to express what you need to reason about a bug. Okay. So you can say things like, uh, "Give me all arguments to, I don't know, this and that function uh, as start node selection. Give me all functions." Then you can traverse in the abstract syntax tree and say, for the call that I have, give me the second argument. And then it becomes really powerful when you can say things like, OK, give me all the statements influencing this variable here by following the data flow links back. Okay? And finally, there are control flow pipes allowing you to even say, OK, give me only those control flow paths which don't go through a certain sanitizer. And that way, you can, you can very precisely describe uh, the kind of bugs that you're looking for. So here's an example. The language is very much in flux. Uh, but you can see, um, well, we're saying uh, this, was a, uh, this was a query to retrieve um, bugs from the Linux kernel. And we're saying, uh, give us all second arguments, uh, third arguments. We start counting at 0. Give us all third arguments to copy from user. Those are length fields. And uh, take only those which have a data flow connection to get user, okay? meaning we control them. So these are length fields and copy operations that we control. And make sure that these length fields are not involved in a what I call check here, meaning uh, it doesn't say uh, count smaller max or something like that. And this was really successful. So this, all the things you see in gray, so these are all the records returned on the Linux kernel. And all the things in gray were vulnerabilities. And they are now fixed. Uh, not all of them, but most of them. So the kernel developers were actually really, they reacted to this immediately. And uh, if you're into this binary exploitation stuff, look at the qf core main c file and the qf snmp command. Uh, function. This one's like an absolute vanilla um, buffer overflow in the kernel. So this is, if, if, you, if, you, if you want to get into how do we exploit a memory corruption in kernel space, I think this, this is like a, a vanilla bug for this, right? So yeah, write that down. Uh, but I also, uh, I also have a link in the end, so you can download the slides. Okay, great. Yeah, and as I said, uh, programmers, um, well, the, the people you write tools for are programmers. So you need to make sure that the, the tools you write actually go well with the environment that they work in. And uh, these kind of queries, uh, the, the whole query language can be used um, by, well, the queries are injected into uh, the um, graph database server using a web interface. And there are libraries for this already. So in the end, what this means is, you can embed these in your Python scripts. So you can make simple queries like the one you just saw, you know, give me all, all those um, variables in these and those arguments that I control. And uh, you, can, you can send it to the server and do the rest, whatever comes back, a, a list of tuples, something like that, do the rest in Python or any other language that you like. Uh, I just think, you know, Python has become very popular in security circles. So Right now, I have example code for Python on my website. Yeah. And now, for the whole left part of the graphic, we're done with this. We've done robust parsing. We answered the question, how do you store this stuff? And I call this entire thing Yuan, like the guy uh, that you saw earlier. Yeah, uh, don't ask me why. It's, it's a complicated story. But uh, now we are ready to do the thing on the right, which is uh, machine learning. OK. OK. So code parse stored. Now look for patterns. OK. So first scenario, vulnerability extrapolation. Um, 
This I encountered a lot of times. So somebody has already given you some information about a vulnerability. Maybe, maybe you already know one or two. There was one in the past. Um, but you're pretty sure that this vulnerability will reoccur somewhere in the code base. You just don't know where. So the only thing you can do without further tools is to manually look for similar code. So I was thinking, maybe we can build a tool which automates this for us. Maybe we can just uh, use uh, a sample of code as a query and get back all functions which are similar to this so that we can quickly check whether the same vulnerability is in there. Okay. Um, yeah, so two, two challenges. We first need to extract program patterns, and second, when we have a bug, we need to find those, other, uh, those same programming patterns in uh, other functions. So here's a real-world example of this. This was a bug in libtiff, and uh, it's essentially a stack-based buffer overflow. Uh, it's very small, I'm sorry. I thought this was, would be bigger. Anyway, so you see that buffer there, uint 8 v4. And then there's a tiff fetch byte array. Yeah, that overflows the buffer because actually the amount of data to be copied is hidden somewhere in this dear struct. And everybody overlooks this because it's completely insane, really. Um, and of course, this happened again. OK, so this time it's called tiff fetch data. So it's somewhat of a synonym uh, to the, what was it, tiff, tiff fetch byte array, exactly. Uh, again, you have this local buffer and the same buffer overflow. And this was actually a very popular bug. This was used for the first uh, um, IOS jailbreaks. So question is, if we have the first bug, can't we automatically find the second one? I mean, it's so similar. Yeah. So to do this, we borrow from text mining. So people in text mining, they've, um, they've had a similar problem. They, they have a, an article written about something and maybe something financial or so, and they want to find all financial articles or sports, all sport articles. So they want to find topics in text documents. And what they do is they employ a method called latent semantic analysis. Um, and we want to use this exact same method and simply adapt it to finding programming patterns. So let's quickly look at what latent semantic analysis does. So let's say you have a text. This is text, so that's one text mm -hmm. document. Then you can repre uh, represent this as a vector. You can simply count how often each word occurs. So uh, in this case, this occurs once, is occurs once, text occurs once, and it, all other words existing in the document corpus occur zero times. Now, if you do this from, for, for several documents, uh, then you get several points in this space. And then you might observe, oh, OK, there are documents which either contain both the word banana and apple, or they don't contain any of them. Okay? So you could say the direction, this direction itself in this space, actually corresponds to a topic, okay? maybe the topic of making a fruit salad. OK? Everything good? Everything good, right? Do the same for code. We simply note down all the API symbols which are being used. And maybe we see, oh, OK, there are many documents. They use both string, copy, and receive, or they don't. And then we could say, OK, this is, this is maybe the topic of processing packets using the C string utilities, something like that. And then, I mean, this already enables you to, to already find uh, all the documents uh, well working in this context of processing packets using the C string utilities. Um, what you see is that um, these, these vectors, um, they encode which of the symbols uh, co-occur and which don't. Um, oh, no, this is, ah, this is not good. OK, yeah. Uh, Let's go here. This is better. OK, great. Um, so you can take this a step further even and say, OK, let's not only take API symbols, but let's take subtrees of the AST. So these are program constructs which occur. And then you can actually see which program constructs commonly occur 
uh, in combination. Okay? And now we project the code only onto the most common patterns that we see in this data, mm, meaning that we essentially denoise. We say, okay, you can, you can either uh, be talking about uh, processing packets uh, in the network context or parsing administrative files, um, but, um, well, we don't allow like arbitrary combinations. Um, and then in this space, we can simply geometrically look which of the functions are similar to us, simply by measuring distances in this space. So the interpretation of this is that nearby functions share mixture of subtrees of vulnerable code, and therefore nearby functions potentially suffer from the same vulnerability. That's the idea. So we did this on FFmpeg. Uh, you might know this. This is a, a, um, a image and video processing library. Um, used in a lot of different tools. And somebody reported a bug in the function flick decode frame 8 BPP. And we used our tool to find similar code. And it immediately told us there's another function, it's called flick decode frame 1516 BPP. But that was in the same source file. So the developers had seen this as well, and they had also patched this one. But then further down, not quite so similar, but still similar enough. You see this function VMD decode contains the exact same vulnerability. And uh, <laughs> we never reported it, but at some point it got fixed. <laughs> and further down, VQA decode chunk also contains that same vulnerability. Yeah, so works. Oh, if you want to see a working exploit for this, you can look into uh, the, our, our paper uh, we had at Woot. Um, this is also on my website, and the link will be at the, in the back of the presentation. OK. So this thing, when I initially implemented it, the whole infrastructure wasn't there. So it took me a while to write. Uh, now the whole extrapolation can be written in like, I don't know, 120 lines uh, of Python on top of this platform, Yearn. And you can also download this script uh, from my website. And don't worry, the slides will be uploaded, so you don't have to note down the link now. OK? Great. Now, for the final trick, <laughs> we're going to talk about missing check detection. This is something I've done uh, very recently. Um, and we use some of the things that we've seen earlier. Um, but this time, the setting is different. Um, here's an example. Mm. This was a bug. Yeah, this was a traumatic bug for me, you could say. So <laughs> what you see here is a, a function in uh, Firefox in the JavaScript engine. Okay? And uh, you can see there's uh, an argument counter, argc, and an array, vp, which contains all the arguments. So these are controlled by somebody writing JavaScript. And then down there, there's a macro, and it reads uh, the first argument, js argv, and then it says 0. Okay? Do you, does, does anybody see the bug already? Maybe. Uh, yeah, so the bug is that nobody ever checks whether arc c is actually larger than 0. OK? So it might be that this first argument doesn't even exist, which means that you, you end up reading arbitrary, well, not arbitrary memory, you, 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 you start reading some memory of the heap. Now you could say, oh, this is not so problematic. How will the attacker control what's on the heap? In the case of a uh, browser, this is not the question for the attacker, because he can write uh, arbitrary JavaScript to uh, allocate lots of bytes and uh, get control over what's on the heap. So essentially, what this bug allows is uh, an arbitrary value, something that the attacker controls, can be read into this ID var. And the person who reported this actually showed that this can be used for arbitrary code execution with a working exploit. A calculator exploit. So of course I was thinking, you know, there's got to be another function which does this, right? And uh, I checked all the handlers, I think all of them, and all of them contained a check for argc, except for this one. <laughs> so in other words, uh, if I had if I had had a tool which would have said, mm, 
you know, this check is performed in many, many similar functions. It's just missing in this one function. Maybe you want to take a look at it. Then there would have been immediate win. Uh, this way it was just painful. Great. So the question is, can we detect this automatically? Can we detect, um, can we first of all extract typical check patterns from the code? And does the code even provide the sufficient amount of information to do this? And finally, is it possible to detect these deviations from a pattern? Okay. So let's make this more precise. Uh, I've said check a couple of times. Uh, what I mean by check is uh, an expression in some sort of condition. Okay, so as in the example here, before you call the sync, there are commonly checks, like the argc check. So in this case, is not okay. If the argument is not okay, then we shouldn't, right, we should not execute, or we should not let data propagate to the sync. Okay. Uh, the same can exist for sources. So for each function, um, we commonly need to check um, what well, this is a very common one. Um, is x equal to null? So for many functions, you need to check if x is equal to null. We just don't know for which ones. And the question is, can we determine this automatically since there's a lot of sample code in the code base? Okay. So to do this, it's a two-step procedure. First, uh, we need to find uh, well, actually, the, the necessity of a check. It is, it is highly uh, dependent on the context. So um, here's a simple example. Uh, if you parse configuration files, then uh, you might be using string APIs, like string copy, string length, string cut, and so on. Uh, so on. Um, but checks will commonly be omitted. And the reason is nobody cares, because the data is controlled by the administrator anyway. Okay? So it's not a vulnerability if the check is missing. Now, if you're parsing text protocols, you might be using the exact same string APIs, but in this case, you need to watch out, and the check needs to be there. Otherwise, uh, well, because the string is attacker controlled, and otherwise you're owned, right? So we use the same trick again, the extrapolation trick, to find similar functions, find functions operating in the same context. So for example, other functions processing network packets with string utility functions. And then for a given function, foo, we have several other examples, very similar code, mu, bu, and wu, and all of them use some operation, and all of them do some sort of check. Okay? And now we just want to calculate which of the checks are normal, so which of the checks occur most of the times, and which are not. And can we find the missing check? Um, so there's one remaining problem, uh, and the remaining problem is that, uh, well, functions can be very large. Um, in particular, if you look at these, yeah, if you look at FFmpeg, for example, you will see very large functions doing various things, and only some of the checks are actually related to the, the sync or source that you're looking at. So we need some sort of data flow analysis, and I implemented this on top of those fuzzy program dependence graphs that you saw earlier. And essentially, I select all the um, statements in the code which are related to the source or sync by data flow. Okay. Um, yeah, and I do this in two directions. Um, I, s uh, I, I follow return values and I follow arguments. Arguments backwards, return values forward. Okay. And then each of these statements is actually, actually corresponds to a subtree of this syntax tree. Okay? So I can now represent this as a vector again. And in this space, each of the dimensions is associated with uh, one sub-expression used in a condition. Okay? Now, that's that space. Okay? So you might have is not OK argument on one axis and red unequal to null on the other axis. And now, uh, all the green ones, those are the similar functions. Um, these functions do similar things to us. And we can now see, um, by simply calculating the mean over this, which of the checks are normal. 
So in this example, we see this is not OK check. Everybody has this, except for us. Okay? And the other check, everybody has this, but we also have it. So we can, we can say exactly which check is probably missing. So it's like your neighbors are voting, and they're saying, you know, we all do this check. You're not doing it. And this is the exact sub-expression that we think you are missing. Okay? And this would have solved my problem. <laughs> so we use this to find some new bugs. Uh, here I essentially just ask for unusual ways of using the function tiff malloc, which is essentially just a wrapper around malloc used in libtiff. And all of the gray things you see are bugs. The dark gray things are even uh, vulnerabilities, and uh, which means you can, you can craft an image um, to, well, in this case, only dereference a null pointer. Um, but the interesting thing here is that the system, well, we did not tell it you need to check the return value of malloc, right? The system learned this by itself because it essentially saw everybody's checking the return value of malloc. Just these ones, they don't do it, OK? And here's a more devastating, I don't know, more a nicer example. Uh, it's a, um, one of the TIFF utilities. And uh, the TIFF utilities all use an API uh, function called TIFF get field to get the values of width and height of the image. And only one, or I think two, I'm not sure, only very few do not immediately perform a check on this. In this case, so this, this was uh, reported by, oh, by the way, the tool is called Chucky. Uh, this uh, was immediately reported as there is probably a missing check here. And indeed, this led to a buffer overflow and uh, possibly code execution, but I didn't go so far. But uh, the nicest thing, in my opinion, is that when you don't know about the API, this tool can, as you browse the code, it can tell you things. For example, the function XML node get data is probably used, I don't know, I, it might be part of libx, libxml. But you can't expect an auditor to know that it can actually return null. This is something you learn along. But Chucky can immediately mark this. It can say, you know, usually in this code base, XML node get data, the, the return value of this is checked. In this case, it's not. And the same for A2i. By, for A2i, if you pass a null pointer, it crashes. So we found several of these bugs as well, uh, some of them triggerable by, by fun icons that you could put in your profile. And it essentially made all Java users uh, on your contact list uh, using Pigeon crash. OK, so impl implementation of this, um, I'm preparing one that's based entirely on Yearn. Okay? Um, the stuff that we use for our paper, I don't particularly like the code. It's research code. But if you really want it, I can give it to you. But you can also wait a while, and we will eventually be releasing the clean version on the website as well. OK. So with that summary, you've seen many disturbing things today. I hope that you also kind of enjoyed yourself and maybe learned something. I don't know. OK. Thanks for your attention.